The case I propose to describe here is that of the tarantula spiders and their arch enemy, the digger wasps of the genus Pepsis. It is a classic example of what looks like intelligence pitied against instinct, a strange situation in which the victim, though fully able to defend itself, submits unwittingly to its destruction. Most tarantulas live in the tropics, but several species occur in the temperate zone and a few are common in the southern U.S. Some varieties are large and have powerful fangs with which they can inflict a deep wound. Tarantulas customarily live in deep cylindrical burrows, from which they emerge at dusk and into which they retire at dawn. Mature males wander about after dark in search of females, and occasionally stray into houses. After mating, the male dies in a few weeks, but a female lives much longer and can mate several years in succession. A fertilized female tarantula lays from 200 to 400 eggs at a time. Thus, it is possible for a single tarantula to produce several thousand young. She takes no care of them beyond weaving a cocoon of silk to enclose the eggs. After they hatch, the young walk away, find convenient places in which to dig their burrows, and spend the rest of their lives in solace. They apparently have little or no sense of hearing, for a hungry tarantula will pay no attention to a loudly chirping cricket placed in its cage unless the insect happens to touch one of its legs. But all spiders, and especially hairy ones, have an extremely delicate sense of touch. Laboratory experiments prove that tarantulas can distinguish three types of touch. Pressure against the body wall, stroking of the body hair, and rifling of certain very fine hairs on the legs called trichobothria. Pressure against the body causes the tarantula to move off slowly for a short distance. The touch excites no defensive response unless the approach is from above, where the spider can see the motion, in which case it rises on its hind legs, lifts its front legs, opens its fangs, and holds this threatening posture as long as the object continues to move. When the motion stops, the spider drops back to the ground, remains quiet for a few seconds, and then moves slowly away. These three tactile responses, to pressure on the body wall, to moving of the common hair, and to flexing of the trichobothria, are so different from one another that there is no possibility of confusing them. They serve the tarantula adequately for most of its needs, and enable it to avoid most annoyances and dangers. But they fail the spider completely when it meets its deadly enemy, the digger wasp Pepsis. The digger wasp is blue in color and has a very tiny wingspan, the largest being just 4 inches. It lives on nectar and gives off a pungent odor when ready to attack. The sting of a digger wasp is much worse than that of a bee or of a common wasp, and the pain and swelling last longer. Adult wasps live only a few months, and during that time, the female produces only a few eggs one at a time over a period of two or three days. For each egg, the mother wasp must provide one adult tarantula, paralyzed, not dead. The mother wasp attaches the egg to the abdomen of the poor spider, and upon hatching, the wasp larva begins to feast on its tarantula, gobbling it alive. In the end, all that is left of the helpless spider is its indigestible skeleton. Finding the right tarantula is an arduous task for the mother wasp. She goes tarantula hunting when the egg in her ovary is almost ready to be laid. Flying low over the ground late on a sunny afternoon, the wasp looks for its victim, or for the mouth of a tarantula burrow, a round hole edged by a bit of silk. The gender of the spider makes no difference, but the mother is highly discriminating as to species. Each species of pepsis requires a certain species of tarantula, and the wasp will not attack the wrong species. To identify the species, the wasp apparently must explore the spire with her antenna. The tarantula shows an amazing tolerance to this exploration. The wasp crawls under it and walks over it without evoking any hostile response. 
The molestation is so great and so persistent that the tarantula often rises on all eight legs, as if it were on stilts. The wasp, having satisfied itself that the victim is of the right species, moves off a few inches to dig the spider's grave. Working vigorously with legs and jaws, it excavates a hole 8 to 10 inches deep with a diameter slightly larger than the spider's grave. Now the wasp is ready to attack. She bends her abdomen, protruding her sting, and searches for the soft membrane at the point where the spider's leg joins its body. The only spot where she can penetrate the horny skeleton from time to time as the exasperated spider slowly shifts ground. The wasp turns on her back and slides along with the aid of her wings trying to get under the tarantula for a shot at the vital spot. During all this maneuvering, which can last for several minutes, the tarantula makes no move to save itself. Finally, the wasp corners it against some obstruction and grasps one of its legs in her powerful jaws. Now, at last, the harassed spider tries a desperate but vain defense. The wasp finally manages to thrust her sting into the soft spot and holds it there for a few seconds while she pumps in the poison. Almost immediately, the tarantula falls paralyzed on its back. Its legs stop twitching, its heart stops beating. After paralyzing the tarantula, the wasp cleans herself by dragging her body along the ground and rubbing her feet. It sucks the drop of blood oozing from the wound in the spider's abdomen. then grabs a leg of the flabby, helpless animal in her jaws and drags it down to the bottom of the grave. Then she emerges, fills the grave with soil carried bit by bit in her jaws, and finally tramples the ground all around to hide any trace of the grave from prowlers. Then she flies away, leaving her descendant safely started in life.